now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, and thank you for joining us for today's presentation, Keeping Your Municipality Safe. Before I get started, just wanted to go over a couple of ground rules for today's webinar. Everyone's phone has been placed on mute for the duration of this webinar. If you have any questions throughout, feel free to put them in the questions tab and we'll get to them as time permits. And if for some reason we don't have the time, we will follow up with you after the webinar. If you are attending this webinar for CPE credit, you will need to complete all three of the polling questions that are asked throughout the webinar. Uh, you'll see them come up uh, periodically. Uh, you'll just have to register a selection there and you will be all set. Uh, but again, all three will need to be completed. At this point, I'd like to introduce today's presenters. Jeff Ziplo is a partner in Bloom Shapiro's Risk Advisory Services Group. He has significant experience working with municipalities to assess their internal IT controls as they relate to business operations and helps to develop recommendations to mitigate risk. In his role, Jeff works with clients on data breach responses, cybersecurity risk assessments, and provides insight and guidance on developing better security practices. Next up, we have Lori Markowski. Lori is a vice president with 36 years of banking experience. Joining Webster in 2003, Lori has held several positions within the Treasury and Payment Solutions Division, including implementation, product management, and sales aligned with, with the government and institutional banking group. Lori partners with, that, with uh, the government and institutional banking relationship managers to provide cash management consultative sales to clients across the four state footprint in Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, and Rhode Island. At this point, I'd like to hand it over to Jeff Ziplo to kick off today's presentation. Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you very much for, for joining us uh, on this webinar. It's a very, very important topic. Um, uh, Lori and I spend quite a bit of time working with municipalities, and we've seen a number of instances where um, uh, there have been cybersecurity incidents um, within uh, many municipalities um, within Connecticut and outside of Connecticut, and, and certainly um, this is a, a hot topic for, for many people. Um, regarding COVID, it, it is um, my contention that this pandemic um, is, is certainly with us today, but what it has done to um, have people rethink what our new normal is going to look like, I think, is really important. And as a result of that, we need to really start thinking about how we can um, keep our municipalities, the municipal operations, safe and secure. And so, I really do believe that you know, COVID has had a, a dramatic impact, actually. Uh, on the safety um, and security of municipal operations. Um, from an overview and objectives perspective, I, I think what we really wanna do is get into and, and talk a little bit about, you know, COVID um, and the impact that has had. Um, I think certainly our new normal um, that we're starting to really get our arms around. We, we need to really take a step back and see what that looks like. Um, we were forced into this new normal relatively quickly. And as a result, we um, initiated, you know, teleworking, remote activities very quickly. And sometimes we did it without, you know, a lot of thought as to, you know, the security, um, and protecting the municipality's information. And so I bring that up because as part of this webinar, we, we do wanna talk about some of the risks uh, from working at home. Um, we, we do wanna talk about um, you know, how we can do things in a better and more effective, more secure way um, as it relates to, to payments and payments processing. Um, we do wanna address any type of concerns or not, all of them, but certainly address some of them as it relates to working from home and our new telework hybrid model. Um, and we're gonna get into best practices. Um, and so um, with that, um, we're actually gonna move forward with a poll. So Jared, the poll question is? Absolutely, so the first question here, has your municipality thought about the security and safety concerns of your operations brought on by COVID-19? Again, if you are attending for CPE credit, you will need to answer all three of these polling questions, and this is the first of those three. 
keep it open for about uh, 10 to 15 more seconds here just to get everyone involved. Perfect, thank you to everyone who participated. And now we'll hand it over to uh, Laurie Markowski to re begin her presentation. Thank you, Jared, and good morning, and thank you all for joining today on our first slide. As cited in Brookings, the avenue, it is clear that the fiscal capacity of governments that rely on a healthy economy for their revenue have been affected. Now more than ever, governments need to respond to their budgetary and financial needs through a review of best practices and diligence. How have you responded to the many challenges that we face in changing business environment, given the pressures of maintaining cost control, despite the impacts on shrinking resources and a reduced labor force? On the next slide, COVID-19 has exposed vulnerabilities in many contingency plans, especially as many employers have moved their employees to working remotely. While fraud should always be top of mind, changes to how we work has increased in the, in the risk of fraud and has brought about change in almost every aspect, forcing us to consider adopting new measures and protocols. Our presentation today we'll ask you to consider, consider thought-provoking questions about your business continuity plans and what best practices you have adopted. Have you reviewed and assessed how your current business continuity strategies have served you? Have you adopted other best practices resulting in changes or refinements to your plans given this pandemic? And have you adequately addressed risk management issues given the increasing and complex threats of security breaches and cyber fraud. Moving to the next slide. In today's banking relationships, it may seem that clients are seeking more strategic and consultative relationships with their banks to assist with future more strategic needs. Setting expectations for how you'd like to engage with your banking partners given the new rules of engagement is really important. Whether it be via email, virtual, via teleconference or video conference, or in person practicing social distancing guidelines, having access to, your, to consult with your banking partner is, is really key. Leveraging new technologies and solutions to manage the daily work requirements in a remote setting may have been a tactical consideration. Be sure to discuss any lessons learned and actions that you would like to take to pursue longer term financial strategies and solutions. Having a keen understanding of the many safeguards to help mitigate risks of cyber fraud to protect your data is critical. Be sure to discuss this topic with your key partners, being the members of your IT organization, human resources, insurance, legal and your banking partner to be sure that you're leveraging the proper controls, policies, procedures, tools, and technologies. Given the market volatility, your trusted banking partner can serve to consult and guide you on the various investment options and tools, as well as long and short-term borrowing needs. A good place to start in evaluating your cash flow and liquidity position may be to examine your current bank account analysis statement. If you have not already done so, review your statement with your banking partner to evaluate your current relationship pricing for services against any excess balances to help identify your cash flow position. On the next slide, <clears throat> in accommodating a contactless environment, we have seen many banking clients make a transition to more automated payment processes. For example, accounts payables and payroll are moving from paper to electronic payments, including same-day ACH payments when necessary. Accounts receivables 
are still leaning on the lockbox modules for expediting the payment of checks. On the next slide. As you look to enhance your plans, if you are still operating in a temporary mode, take what you've learned during this pandemic and consider making a change to more optimal payment alternatives. What works in an emergency may not be the most optimal permanent solution. Setting up redundant payment solutions will help you adapt to what will likely be a more flexible operating environment. With an automated solution, all payment approvals and workflows are online with visibility into every payment as it moves through the system, which will give you the optimal control over cash flow. On slide 10, or moving to the next slide, um, expediting cash flow through electronic payments is important as it adds the safety and soundness of your payment, especially in times when fraud is so prevalent. Best practices through the adoption of digital solutions to maximize efficiencies, cycle time and cost may be delivered through online banking products and services. Aligning yourselves with the right electronic payment solution for the long term is really key. For example, converting checks to electronic payments such as ACH, wire, or acquiring other payment capabilities like online business bill pay, uh, online payments made via electronic check or credit card, or merchant services at your location may all be viable options. Equally important are the security measures for protecting payment information as you make or receive payments using dual controls, online banking alerts, fraud mitigation services, especially as you consider the expectations and concerns of your residents, seniors, taxpayers, your housing authorities, Board of Ed, and considering what they care about. On the next slide, these electronic payment solutions can further enhance workflow efficiencies, cash flow, and give you peace of mind that your payments are being expedited in an efficient and secure manner. Purchase card, lockbox solutions, and remote deposit capture have become a viable solution for tax collections, especially in the recent months where many are seeking touchless payment alternatives. Another convenient solution to consider is a debt service payment program. Many of the state's and town finance offices who are responsible for making timely debt service payments may still be operating out of their norm and may find it helpful to have your bank take the responsibility to administer your debt service payment obligations for you at the appropriate scheduled times. On the next slide, this slide illustrates how creating layers of security will help to mitigate risk. Also, seeking specific advice on what those layers might be from your banker is important. Think about who can access data and how, and the key people who should know about the operating account. From a risk mitigation standpoint, Segregating accounts for payment inflows and outflows is the optimal account structure. A separate account for check and electronic funds transfer activities is recommended. Not everyone should have access to all data or administrative rights to certain accounts or computers. Using dual control and alert notifications offered in your online banking system is a great control never and not to be underestimated. These functions usually come without additional costs and offer increased protection against fraud. On the next slide is a fraud and risk mitigation um, overview. And too many organizations have fallen victim and have experienced attempted or actual payment fraud. Your operations cannot afford to be disrupted or to have funds stolen by criminals and malicious software. Remember, fraudsters tend to exploit in times of confusion. A small local community cannot assume that it will go unnoticed. And yes, the news always talks about the larger breaches, 
but cyber criminals also prey on smaller targets that may not have the IT capacity or leadership focus needed to prepare for and to prevent potential cyber risks. Last month, um, citing an example here, in September, Jonathan Stone, the CTO of the Kelser Corporation, wrote an article in the Hartford Current about how well the city of Hartford responded to a ransomware cyber attack. The city had made a substantial investment of time and financial resources on a cybersecurity response plan, which enabled the detection of a cyber breach within two days of the attack. Typically, a breach may infiltrate a system and go undetected for more than 197 days and, and take months actually to recover. The city was commended for doing everything correct in their recovery. Uh, the city actually closed its schools for one day since the system that operates the school transportation had not yet been restored as 200 out of the 300 servers were affected um, however, the city's recovery response um, due to their, their timely investment in their cyber readiness plan, and that was said to be exemplary. So, in essence, we can never underestimate being ready and having a readiness response plan. On the next slide, we're talking about best practices for protecting staff and your municipality. Secure your workplace and access to paper files from non-employees, including your trash. Limit authorization to only employees who need it. Segregate duties within the accounting department. Conduct surprise audits, periodic risk assessments, and evaluate existing controls. Rotate banking duties among staff to prevent collusion. Review system access privileges regularly. Educate and train employees, vendors, temporary staff, and customers for understanding and compliance on cybersecurity issues, internal, or excuse me, external dangers, internal controls, protection of information and systems. And we recommend that you do not embed signatures in emails or put employee email addresses on your website. Also for protecting and controlling financial transactions, use dedicated and protected computers, ideally one for every user if that's possible. Follow dual control procedures, segregate the duties, for example, staff that issues payments versus those that do the reconciliation. Validate email instructions to place a wire transfer of funds or to change any recipient address or, or account information using a known number or verify request in person before ever processing a change request. Scan emails and email addresses for phishing clues and possible red flags, for example, spelling and grammar. Verify the URL, URL destination. Notice odd greetings, a sense of urgency, request for action, request for personal information, all of which are phishing clues. We recommend that you convert paper-based payments to electronic payments, review and update signature cards annually, physically turn off your computer, do not share, publish, or provide your employer ID numbers under unless absolutely required and validated to whom this information is required by. Do not include sensitive information, such as social security numbers and payroll file transmissions. Ensure negotiable documents have a control number and that they're managed under dual controls. On the next slide, we'll discuss business continuity plans. Planning in advance will help to identify the most effective way to communicate with various groups. First and foremost, draft a comprehensive information security policy. Your IT experts can assist to devise one. It should detail network access for employees and contractors and a formal agreement 
from all applicable parties. Document logical and physical address access controls. Deploy operating system network software, antivirus, security, certification verifications, and patches regularly. Impl implement a comprehensive unified threat management system, also known as a UTM, inclusive of intrusion protective software, IPS, and to ensure network routers are protected. Consider a process con to conduct periodic risk assessments. Create a system inventory, list all components, policies, procedures, and details of its operation. Identify risks, for example, reputational, operational, or technology. Severity of the impact and likelihood of occurrence. Identify safeguards for controlling threats and vulnerabilities. And very, very important, engage your key partners, members of IT, human resources, insurance, legal, and your bank in the business continuity risk management plans and discussions. A strong business continuity plan maps out an organizational structure and lists roles and responsibilities so employees are aware of their tasks. Ensure emergency response team have a contact list including backups and day and evening information. Create and review business continuity and disaster recovery testing plans, which focus primarily on the recovery of IT systems after a crisis. Beware of services to your organization that are web enabled. If you do experience a malware attack, do not turn off your device. Disconnect from the network and follow risk management protocols. And lastly, and probably most importantly, test. We highly recommend testing your entire business continuity plan, at least annually and semi-annually if possible. You may have a great plan, but if you never fully tested it, it can fail you in a time of crisis. And then be sure to make changes resulting from things that didn't go well to update your plans. And in our final slide. As we look to the future, we identify these best practices as a call to action. Aligning with the many digital banking solutions offered today, like the online bill pay, online payments, merchant services, mobile banking, etc., can help you solve the complexities and constraints you may be experiencing in your daily operations. As you make the transition to these various solutions, you will gain better control, improve efficiencies, and become more agile to meet the ongoing changes and challenges of the future. Um, on the next slide, I think that, that is our last, sorry, uh, just a couple of final words here. I apologize. Um, partnering and collaborating again with your big your key partners to ensure that you have a business continuity risk management plan in place identifies imperatives in your planning effort. A, a cyber breach plan goes hand in hand with a focused education and awareness plan for all employees. Your business continuity and risk management plans should be practiced and reviewed for other potential disasters, including a pandemic. And as previously stated, consider running a mock test event of your business continuity plans in full, at least annually. And update the plan as changes are detected or gaps are identified. And with that, I will turn this back over to you, Jared. Great, thank you. We've got our second poll question here, and that's, has your municipality updated your business continuity plans to reflect this new environment? Again, if you are attending for CPE credit, uh, you will need to complete the polling questions asked throughout the webinar. So uh, this is number two here. Keep this open for about uh, another 15 seconds or so here to give everyone an opportunity to participate.
Just another couple seconds here. Great, thank you everyone. Now hand it off to uh, Jeff Ziplo. Thank you, Jared. So what I'd like to do is spend a little bit of time um, this morning just sharing with you um, some cyber trends and statistics that we're seeing um, um, globally as well as um, specifically with um, municipalities and school districts. Um, so on the next slide, um, you'll see that one of the, the things, one of the, the, the the areas of concern is ransomware. And I'm gonna spend a bit more time on this, but it is one of the most dangerous threats out there. Um, and it has evolved and it's significantly involved, evolved, I should say, um, over the past year or two. Um, what we are seeing is that um, pretty much, you know, every 39 seconds, every 30 seconds, there's another type of attack. Phishing is the most prevalent. So we're receiving and, and actually being bombarded with um, phishing emails on a regular basis. And we just, we need to be able to, to teach people, right? How to respond to um, phishing uh, emails and what they need to do and what they need to be looking for. Um, and, and we'll get into a little bit more of that uh, in, in just a little bit. Um, the um, we are seeing a, a fairly significant increase, and I would say because of COVID, we're we're seeing a significant increase um, in the percentage of cyber crimes that are being reported. And and the, the on the bullet point here, you're, you know, FBI has reported, you know, a three hundred percent increase. Um, that I, I think we all just need to be aware of because. Um, it is the wild, wild west out there, and it's getting worse. And I think we just need to be mindful of what that means to us, our respective municipality, and what we can do to mitigate and minimize those threats. On the next page, um, you'll you'll actually see that 95% um, of the you know cyber breaches are due to human error. Um, and it's not done intentionally. We, we just have people that trust, you know, they, they trust an email that looks like it's coming from their manager or supervisor. They trust an email that is, looks like it's coming from a friend. They, they, during the, the COVID, you know, world that we're living in, people want to trust others. And so we just need to, to make people aware that um, we need to trust but verify. Um, we need to stop, think, and then react. We, when we get an email um, and review an email, look at it. Um, Lori was talking about some other, you know, things to take a look at when you're reviewing the email, the spelling, did it make sense, some of the terms, um, the links that are on there. But we just need to have people stop, think, and then react. And if it's, gee, it doesn't smell right, then get rid of the email and or um, tell IT, because if you do have uh, a good IT department, they'll, uh, they'll want to know so they can get the message out to people. Um, a, uh, an incident response plan, and, and I, I'm bringing this up because as the slide indicates, most people don't have one. 77% of the organizations do not have an incident response plan. And, and the reason that that is so important is what do we do if in fact we think something's going on? And, and that an incident response plan will help guide us. And it's not something that you wanna create, you know, the day of. It, it's really important to have, and as I think Lori mentioned, tested, you know, mock test just to, to make sure that it does make sense and, and is, is a solid document. Um, Lori also mentioned, and I'll just share with all of you that, you know, attacks are happening and they're, they're actually, the attackers are inside your environment and they sit there for six months or more. Um, I've seen um, situations where they've been in, um, in an organization, in a company um, for years and they're just exfiltrating out information. And we just need to be able to figure out ways to do a better job of identifying potential breaches and getting rid of them. 
And the last point here is the these things called IoT devices. So IoT stands for Internet of Things, and it is anything from Google Home to um, many different types of devices that people have. Alexa is another one. Um, and the reason I'm bringing it up is for a couple reasons. One is um, the, the number of IoT devices has increased exponentially. And you can see here 31 billion devices you know, at the end of 2020. We have a lot of these devices at home. Some are um, in the office, but the ones particularly at home, because of the new teleworker environment that we've created, the IoT devices, some of them are not secure. And we've heard instances where, you know, um, you know, Alexa is listening, Google is listening to our conversations and picking up pieces of information. And we just need to be conscious of that and, and make sure whatever security protocols that we can put into place to enhance overall security, enhance the, our, our security posture, um, we do so and, and we do so in a very directed way. I want to move forward now with ransomware and, and, and I want to really stop here and just share with everyone the significant changes that have occurred. So if we were having this webinar um, five years ago, one of the things, you know, I would certainly tell you is, you know, the, the old ransomware someone received um, uh, an email and inadvertently clicked on a link. And again, I'm going back to that human experience, the people experience. Um, they inadvertently clicked on a link and um, some software, a payload was downloaded to our computer. And then all of a sudden, you know, our computer started going a little wacko and, and uh, information started being encrypted not only on our computer but it went out to the network any of the shared drives that we had access to would be encrypted and then up on the screen it pop up a message and it said your information is being encrypted and you need to pay a ransom in Bitcoin and we've probably heard that scenario a number of times well things have changed things have morphed into um, actually, I call it double extortion. So here's what the new ransomware looks like. The first couple of steps, as I mentioned earlier, are, are pretty much the same. Um, someone clicks on a bad link, gets software downloaded, a payload gets downloaded. However, that information or, or that software is actually downloaded to your PC. And now the attackers have a way to access your network. And so now the attackers are, are, you know, not just automatically encrypting your systems. They're out there looking for information and they're scouring your network and identifying all the crown jewels, if you will, of information that you and your network have. And so once they figured all that out, um, what they're going to do is they're going to package up that information and they're going to exfiltrate it out of your network and send it out. They're going to send it to um, uh, they're going to send it to themselves actually. So now that the information is out of your network, now they do the encryption, right? And so now they have um, information that is you know critical to your network that is all encrypted. And we've seen some of this um, city of Baltimore. Uh, uh, city, uh, Georgia, not the city of Atlanta, Georgia, was, was impacted by this. And th there were some significant ransoms that had to be paid. And I guess that's the other um, thing that has changed. Five years ago, you know, the cost of ransomware was in the tens of thousands of dollars. Um, it has transformed itself into hundreds of thousands of dollars. So what we're dealing with now is we, we, we're, our data has been encrypted. If we don't pay the ransom, and this is where the double extortion comes in, if we don't pay the ransom, what the attackers are now saying is, we're gonna take your information and we're going to put all the information that we extracted out of your network and we're gonna put it on the deep dark web. And so you either pay us for not putting it out on the deep dark web and you pay us for the encryption keys, 
or we're really going to um, uh, make sure that you, you have some really big issues, the encryption and the data that was ex exfiltrated that you're going to have to deal with. And it has become a huge, huge problem for municipalities, for school districts, and for you know um, many other types of organizations. As Lori mentioned, the city of uh, the school district of the city of Hartford was attacked. It was a ransomware attack. Um, they did a a reasonably good job of not being you know totally. Um, uh, uh, um, put in an awkward and uncomfortable situation. They had software tools in place to bring themselves back um, and to recognize the problem relatively immediately. So uh, the, the point that I want to get to, and I'm going to move on in one second, is ransomware is not your friend. It has evolved. It has changed. And we really need to protect um, our networks so that we don't get ransomware. Moving on to the next slide. Um, remote access. Um, so there's multiple um, areas of remote access. Um, the one that we're talking about here is we have people accessing our networks, particularly um, HVAC vendors. If we have uh, Vo VoIP stands for a Vo voice over IP, so our telephone systems, we've got people that are in our networks that are supporting um, these various systems. And we need to make sure that their environment as it is as secure as possible. The Home Depot breach that compromised a number of credit cards um, um, was actually, in fact, due to an HVAC vendor that was not secure. And so they found the conduit first through the HVAC vendor and then to Home Depot's network as well. So we just need to be very mindful of the, you know, our, our these outside vendors and and do our best to protect um, uh, ourselves through them. On the next slide, um, we can't forget about our phones. Um, more and more security breaches are occurring through our smartphones, and to be quite frank, we call them smartphones they're really very sophisticated computers and they can do virtually anything a normal laptop or, or notebook or desktop computer can do, um, but they're doing it in a smaller package. Plus it also has wireless, plus it's probably storing all of your credit card information on it and other credentials, passwords and things like that. So. We really need to start thinking about protecting our smartphones and minimizing and mitigating attacks on our smartphone. And, and one of the points here is, um, one, we need to really think about what information is being stored on our smartphones. But equally important, your smartphone should be encrypted. And you want to do, if, if on, on the um, uh, Apple iPhones, if you have a password on an Apple iPhone, it is automatically encrypted just in case you lose your phone. You can feel comfortable that no one would be able to break into your phone. But also be mindful of the fact if you received a text or an email on your on your phone and you click on that link and you don't know where it's coming from, it could expose you to some some to a cyber attack. And so I think it's really important, you know, that um, that you just be mindful of that as well. The next slide is just to, to give you all an idea about what I mentioned earlier, this, this concept of the deep and dark web. Um, we know the internet as the, the Googles, the Yahoos, the Facebook, Netflix, and many other uh, types of um, capabilities and, and search engines that are out on um, out on the internet. Well, guess what? There's a lot more underneath the surface. There's a lot more information that we, the normal person, never sees and will never see um, because we just don't go down into the deep dark web. You actually need or a, a particular browser uh, called, you know, Tor, the onion router, to actually get into the deep dark web. And that will prevent, you know, your identi identity from being identified. But the deep dark web is where all the, a lot of, not all, but a lot of the information um, that um, 
that gets uh, exfiltrated out of our networks is stored. And, and I'm bringing this up, not because I expect anyone on this webinar to go out to the deep dark web, but you should know that there is something else that exists out there. And that's where all this information is being stored. So moving on um, in our discussions, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the, the life work separation as we get into this new teleworker environment. And when you, when you look at the next slide, I think what you'll hopefully gather from it is when we were protecting the municipal networks, right? And, and that's represented by the, the three major networks that you see here, right? We have the one main location, which is typically, you know, uh, city or town hall. And then we've got these remote locations, but it was relatively fixed, not relatively, it was fixed. And we knew what that protection needed to be for the network that we had for the remote locations, the remote buildings and such. Well, again, things have changed. and with the whole teleworking environment, and now you can see the homes and the networks within the homes, we've created something that has exponentially increased what needs to be protected. And so our teleworkers are working at home. They in turn have their own networks with their own security flaws. And it is a challenge to try and make sure that those, um, uh, networks, those home networks are secure. So a couple of things just to point out. On the next slide, what, what I want you to understand and, and look at is using a home PC to access uh, a municipal network is not a good idea. Um, and it's not a good idea for several reasons. We don't know how and, and what the security protocols are on that home PC. Right, so we don't know if it has the most up-to-date virus protection software. We don't know if it's already been infected. We don't know if it is fully patched to to provide you know a, a decent level of security. So those are the the reasons why we need to think maybe a little bit differently and make sure that if people need to work at home, they're working from computers that are delivered by the municipality. Um, and, and one of the things, and I've been talking to a ton of municipalities about this, is um, now and, and in the new world of COVID, I'm not really sure why a municipality would buy um, a desktop computer. Um, I would say we would do it in the past because it, there was a, a lower dollar cost to it. But given the fact of COVID and being able to pro provide workers with, you know, uh, uh, laptop computers, I would certainly strongly suggest that, you know, as we move forward, that those computers are, are purchased, you know, via a laptop, a tablet type of computer. So it gives us the ability to, to give it to people if they, in fact, do need it. Um, I, I think that we also need to be careful that if when we are using a computer at home that we don't have other people who are using it or able to access it like um, a, a wife or, or a child, they could inadvertently download software, they could inadvertently respond to an email or click on something that is going to cause problems, you know, on that computer as a whole. Um, and then we shouldn't be storing any type of municipal data on those computers. Um, we should make sure and ensure that all information is maintained um, at the municipality. Um, other aspects, and moving on to the next slide, is you know our home networks. We need to make sure that they're secured um, by changing the, the standard user ID and passwords on the router that we have at home. Um, and enforcing good security settings and practices on the firewall, um, setting up um, uh, Wi-Fi security passwords so no one can access our home network from the outside, and if possible, only allowing selected devices to attach to your home network. Um, it shouldn't be open to you know someone sitting outside your house and 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 accessing it. So, um, moving on to the next slide, social engineering, 
and and this has become a real big issue, particularly in the world of of tele you know teleworking. So here's some questions for you. If your IT department called you um, at home or or through the you know um, uh, telephone system um, through the municipality, and they said, hey, you know we're having some issues with the network. We need to get your credentials. Would you give it to them? You know, if the mayor asked you, or if you, if the mayor asked you, or you thought it was the mayor through an email or something along those lines for W-2 information, would you provide it to him or her? If you received a text message on your phone from a colleague that it included a link, would you click on that link? And I bring all these discussion points up because um, the answer to all of them should be no. I will never provide my IT department with my credentials because I don't know if it really is my IT department. I could get a phone call from them, I could get an email from them, but I really don't know if it truly is them. So we need to be careful of that. Um, if the mayor, if the town manager, or any other superintendent, any other key official is asking for personal or confidential information, I think we need to check in with them. And there's a technology that I use that will help everyone. That technology is the telephone. Pick up the phone, give someone a call, and validate and make sure that their request is, is true, that their request is, is really what they were asking for. Many times you'll find that it, that it was not. And even though you think that you received a, uh, a text message from a friend that contained a link, um, there are ways to spoof um, text messages very easy. You can do it, you know, in, in, in a, you don't have to be a technologist to make it happen. Um, so be careful of that. So moving on to passwords. Um, and, and the next slide actually is a, a good example. When, when we walk around and do technology assessments, we'll, we'll see a lot of this. People have a ton of passwords. They have a ton of passwords at home. Please, 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 even if it's on your home computer, don't put your passwords out. There are better ways to manage them. Um, and, the, and I'm gonna get into it right now. Um, if you look at the next slide, a um, couple things about passwords. And, and you know, th these are true um, uh, statistics. If I have a six character password, I, it can be broken in 12 seconds. Um, and, and you can read the, the rest. Look what happens when I have a password that is 12 characters, right? Look at the number of years, 7.5 million years. The longer, the better. The longer, the more secure. So we need to have longer passwords. I recommend using passphrases because overall, I think that's the best way to go and certainly enhances, um, and it's something you can remember and think. Um, but you shouldn't be using uh, dictionary um, terms. You shouldn't be using your dog's name. You shouldn't be using those types of things. Um, moving on to the next slide, you know, is what a, a virtual private network should look like. And what a virtual or a VPN should look like is at home to the municipality, we've got this, it's called the VPN tunnel. And that VPN tunnel is a secure, encrypted tunnel that makes it look like that I have a direct connection from my home to the municipality and no one can break into it. And it's really important that you ensure that you are using a, a VPN, if at all possible, um, when you're communicating um, between your home and the municipality. The other thing you should be using on the next slide um, is multi-factor authentication. Something you know and something you have. So something you know is your user ID and password. It's something that, that you know, and unfortunately we have a lot of them. But it's also, we need to get into the concept and, and, and multi-factor authentication or MFA is something you have. And so up in the um, right-hand corner of the screen, you'll see it says RSA ID. So that's an ID that changes every 30 seconds, and it's a device that we're actually holding on to. So that's something I have. 
most of the time now we have the something that you have is associated with our cell phone. So it's our mobile device that we have with us. It's um, our, um, it, it will either get a phone call, we'll get a text message, or we'll get something that comes up and says, will you approve this? Um, and again, if it's not, if, if someone has stolen our, our um, telephone, our cell phone, I should say, um, they won't have the password to, to actually get into it. So we don't have to worry about the something that we have piece and component. Challenge questions on the next slide is, is another discussion point. Um, we're all exposed to these challenge questions and we just need to think a little bit differently. All the questions on the screen, pet's name, high school, favorite movie, all of them can be identified and found out in social media these days. So if I have a Facebook account, um, or even if someone does a general search on the internet, they can all get, get this information. So I always say a challenge question, there's no right answer. Put in an answer that doesn't make sense, has nothing to do with social media. In this case, you can see I, I was suggesting maybe blue jumping jacks. Um, so moving on to, to best practices and teleworking tips, I, I think we do need to develop standards, um, standard policies and procedures, you know, on, on how people should work securely at home. And we need to set those expectations up with our employees. Um, we need to provide equipment to them that will help secure the municipality. And I know that's difficult. Um, municipalities are running lean and mean, and they're also running um, hopefully not too big a deficit, but we do know some municipalities that are in a deficit situation. But in order for our teleworkers to be safe, we're gonna have to figure out that equation. Um, and, and I think we're also gonna need to make sure that, that we do all of this um, in person, but in person can mean through Teams, through Zoom, whatever, but we, we need to get a sense of what are some of the challenges our teleworkers are having. So Jared, I'm gonna turn it over to you for the last poll question, I believe. Same here, and that's, does your municipality have protocols in place to protect against cyber threats associated with telework? So again, if you are attending for CPE, uh, we do need you to answer the poll questions here uh, in order to get that credit. So uh, we'll keep this open for about another 15, 20 seconds here. Uh, Great, thanks everybody. So last on the list, but probably the most important topic is our employees. Um, I, I use the, the, the term here, patching our employees, because to be quite frank, they're part of the process to make our municipality more secure. Um, so some key, ingredients, if you will, that you need to be aware of. I always say that our employees are really our first line of defense, that they can be your greatest asset or they could be your worst liability. I like to think of our employees as our greatest asset. They can identify for us when things don't look right, don't feel right, and they can provide immediate information to IT or to someone to say something doesn't feel right on our network. Something isn't right. Um, they can talk to their coworkers. They can say, gee, were you getting a lot of phishing uh, emails recently? And, and that just puts in that person's mind the idea of, oh, I should be on the lookout for, for phishing. Um, we cannot provide enough security awareness training to our employees. And if you're not doing anything, I always tell people something's better than nothing. I highly recommend that we do um, security awareness training on a regular basis. And we can determine what regular is monthly or quarterly. Um, 
at worst annually, but we need to do something. We need to show people and, and demonstrate to our employees that, you know, fishing and spear fishing are, are real issues and we need them to understand to stop, think, and then click if appropriate. Um, we need them to think about how to best send sensitive data out. You know, I would tell people, we never want to send any type of sensitive data out via email. It always has to be encrypted. Um, and so we, we also need to just be aware of these things and, and share it with our employees. Um, on the next slide, you'll see that um, in, in sharing with everyone, you know, phishing your employees um, is, is a good thing. There are some tools out there. Um, I, we use a product called Know Before. Um, that allows you to fish your employees. And what that does is it, it gives them and you an opportunity of, of identifying employees that need more training. Um, you know, some people say, you know, is it the carrot or the stick? In my mind, it's the carrot, right? We want people to, to be aware of issues that they think may be there. Maybe they're not, but at least let's get them aware let's provide a level of training um, and and I think what we have seen is by implementing you know awareness training to employees we can really ratchet down exponent exponentially um, the number of times someone will respond to a, a, a bad email and um, this is really really important because um, we can have the best hardware we can have the best software that's out there that protects us. But if we can't use our employees and train our employees to stop, think, and then react, um, it doesn't matter how good your technology is. So with that, I'm gonna go to questions and answers. I don't know if we have any questions, but certainly wanna spend or provide some, some time if there were any questions. Jeff, one that, that I've got here, when looking to, uh, you know, implement some of these cyber best practices that, that you mentioned today, where's the best place to get started if you're really just trying to, to ramp up some of these efforts? Um, I go back to people. You really need to train your employees um, and make them aware of these ransomware attacks. I, I have to tell you, the ransomware attacks are really bad. Um, and it, it takes um, not days, but weeks or months to resolve a ransomware attack. And, and the other thing I didn't mention is um, we're actually negotiating with the people that, you know, uh, that have us uh, for ransom. And there's actually ongoing dialogues and conversations of what those dollars are. So there is some negotiations, but let's not even get there. We need to be proactive and, and mitigate our risk through our employees is what I would suggest. Great. Thanks, and, Jeff. And Jeff, I would Jeff, I would also add that consulting and partnering with your key business partners is really key. So tapping into IT um, your IT partners, your insurance folks, legal, um, your bankers, all those key folks really are your partners to help devise the best plans possible. Sounds good. All right, great. And I know we're, we're just at about time here. So um, thank you everyone for attending today. Uh, if you do have any questions, feel free to uh, to reach out and uh, we could follow up with any, any questions that you might have had that we might not have had a chance to get to. So thank you everyone and uh, appreciate you coming out today. Thank you. Thank you.